All right, let's uh, dive right into this. Tonight, we are taking a deep dive into Bram Stoker's Dracula. Specifically, the mm. later chapters. Right. Those, uh, those like, last... Where the action really picks up. Yeah, when things get really, really good. Exactly. So we're talking about, you know, the gothic atmosphere. Victorian anxieties. Oh, yeah. And... The allure of the unknown. The horror of the unknown. Yeah. It's all there. It's all there, right? But we should probably give folks a quick rundown of the main players before we get too far. Yeah, definitely. So we've got Count Dracula, obviously. Transylvanian nobleman with a taste for blood. Right. And uh, then there's Jonathan and Nina Harker. The newlyweds caught in his web. And, of course, we can't forget Van Helsing. The professor. The vampire hunter extraordinaire. He's the one who really knows what's going on. He's the expert. Right. And then there's that whole crew of... Uh, Seward, Homewood, Morris. Yeah. Yeah. All those guys, they're like this band of vampire hunters, right? A ragtag team, but they're That's determined. Determined. Absolutely. So basically what we're trying to do here is uncover how these guys are working to defeat Dracula. Yeah, their strategies. That they're afraid of. Their fears. That they're good at. Their triumphs. And ultimately, Lee. What makes this story so powerful? Okay, so let's get into it. We're starting right in the action. These guys know Dracula is a vampire, and they are hunting him down. They're on his trail. But before we get too far ahead, we got to set the scene. Think Transylvania, Dracula's castle. You're seeing it through Jonathan Harker's eyes. He describes it all in his journal. Early on in the book. Yeah, like those first few chapters. Chapters one and three. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just any old spooky castle. This place is isolated, like way up in the Carpathian Mountains. It's wild, untouched. Harker calls it a vast ruined castle from whose tall black windows came no ray of light and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the sky. Ooh, spooky, right. And I think that isolation really plays into those Victorian anxieties. It's like the castle represents everything they feared about the unknown. Absolutely, the fear of the other. And what's interesting is that Dracula, he's obsessed with the opposite. He's drawn to London. The heart of modern life. Exactly. Harker mentions in his journal that Dracula is longing to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. So he wants to be in the thick of it, right. But like beneath that sophisticated exterior, there's this predatory hunger. There's a darkness there. Yeah, it's unsettling, like this refined gentleman, but also a monster. It's that duality that makes him so fascinating and so terrifying. Totally. Okay, so let's move on to Lucy Westenra. Ah, yes, poor Lucy. We see things through Dr. Seward's diary entries, and it's like watching this slow-motion horror show unfold. Her condition worsens over time. Right, and there are these weird things happening. She's sleepwalking. Flapping at the window. A bat shows up. All very strange. And then Van Helsing arrives, right? He comes in with garlic and crucifixes. Not your typical doctor. No, even Seward's a bit skeptical, you know? He represents a clash between the rational and the irrational. Yeah. You've got science and the supernatural battling it out. Totally. And then there's Renfield. That guy's creepy. Zoophagus, they call him. Right. Eating bugs, spiders, birds. He even says, I don't want to eat them raw. If, okay, I'm getting the chills. It's all connected to Dracula, you know? <laughs> like a twisted reflection of the Count's own thirst. And it makes you think, what separates us from the beasts? It's a question that haunts the entire novel. So things take a truly horrifying turn when Lucy's tomb is found empty. She's gone. And not just gone, she's become a vampire. Right. It's devastating for everyone, especially Arthur. The man she was supposed to marry. It really drives home the point that no one is safe from Dracula. His influence spreads like a disease. And what's really awful is that Arthur has to be the one to kill Lucy. To spake her. Yeah, talk about a sacrifice. He has to destroy the woman he loves to save her soul. It's heartbreaking. And then there's that scene with the child, remember? The bluefer lady. Lucy, preying on the innocent. It's a reminder of Victorian feels about the loss of innocence. And the vulnerability of children. Yeah, and the way Stoker describes it. Just chilling. So with Lucy gone, the others realize they have to step up their game. They have to find a way to stop Dracula. And that's where Mina really comes in. She's got this psychic connection to the Count. It's both a blessing and a curse. Right. Terrifying, but also incredibly useful for tracking him. It's through Mina that they start to understand his movements. Yeah, she becomes this crucial piece of the puzzle. Her journal entries are filled with cryptic clues, 
like pieces of a horrifying puzzle. And the puzzle takes the form of tracking Dracula's boxes of Earth, right? They have to follow his trail across London. It's like this cat and mouse game. The stakes are incredibly high. And they almost have him cornered in Piccadilly, but then they find Mina with Dracula. The confrontation is brutal. They nearly catch him. But he escapes. It's a huge setback. But it also fuels their determination to stop him. They know they can't give up. The fate of the world might depend on it. Mina's bravery in all of this is amazing. She accepts her fate. She's willing to become a vampire if it means stopping him. Her journal entries are full of fear, but also strength. She writes, I am now, God help me, alone in all the world. It's just incredible how strong she is. And so the chase begins. They're following that last box of Earth, racing against time. The tension is unbearable. Yeah. We'll have to pick up this thrilling pursuit in the next part of our deep dive. You're not kidding. This is just getting good. Last we left off, our heroes were on a frantic chase across Europe. Right. They're trying to stop Dracula before he can get back to his castle. It's a race against time with Mina's condition worsening every moment. It's a pretty big shift going from London to Transylvania. Yeah, geographically and like, you know, psychologically. Right, so going from the modern world to this place where the rules are different, darker. More primal. And Jonathan Harker, he's really pushed to his limits during all this. He's exhausted. Worried sick about Mina. Determined to save her. It's a lot to handle. There's a part in his journal he says, sleep, whilst it lasts, is a rest and a forgetfulness but he's also afraid to sleep. Afraid of what he'll find when he wakes up. Exactly. And all the while, Mina's connection to Dracula is growing stronger. It's almost like she's sharing his thoughts, his feelings. It's got to be terrifying. Yeah, imagine feeling the darkness creeping into your mind. Her journal entries get really intense during this part. She even suggests that the others should kill her if it means stopping Dracula. Oh, wow. She writes, it is I who am the danger now. Talk about selflessness. It's like she's losing herself, becoming something she doesn't recognize. And the landscape, it mirrors that transformation. As they get closer to Transylvania, everything gets more rugged, more desolate. Those looming mountains, those dark forests. So it's a physical representation of the darkness they're fighting. And then there are the Sugani, those gypsies who are helping Rashmul. Oh, to the They add another layer of danger to all of this. And it's like Dracula's power is amplified in his homeland. He's drawing strength from the very soil of Transylvania. And we see those echoes of Lucy's fate with the bluefer lady attacking that child. It's a brutal reminder that Dracula's evil can't be contained. Right. It spreads like a virus. And just when the hunters think they're closing in on the Sligany, Van Helsing realizes they've been tricked. Dracula was always one step ahead. Playing a deadly game with them. It must have been devastating knowing they'd walked right into his trap. But they press on. They have to. They arrive at Dracula's castle. That place sounds like something out of a nightmare. It's described as a vast, ruined castle from whose tall, black windows came no ray of light. And inside, they encounter the three vampire brides. Those alluring and seductive creatures. Trying to tempt Harker. Offering him pleasure and oblivion. It's like a test of his loyalty, his willpower. He has to choose between giving in to temptation or remaining true to Mina. And he chooses Mina. Love and duty prevail. It's a powerful moment, showing that even in the face of darkness, there's hope. But the fight isn't over. They finally reach Dracula's coffin. And the battle is brutal. A fight for their lives and for Mina's soul. Stakes, hammers, crucifixes, they use everything they have. They're driven by their love for Mina and their hatred for Dracula. Can you imagine the intensity? The desperation? But victory comes at a price. Quincy Morris is killed. He sacrifices himself right. to ensure Dracula's destruction. A true hero. It's a reminder of the bonds these characters share. They're willing to die for each other. <sighs> and finally, with Dracula gone, the curse on Mina is lifted. Relief washes over the survivors. That they'll never be the same. They face true evil and come out the other side. But it's not over yet. We still have to unravel the deeper meaning behind it all symbolism and the legacy of this story. That's what we'll be exploring in the final part of our deep dive. All right, so we've covered the chase, the battles, the heartbreak, but Dracula is so much more than just a thrilling story. It's like this tapestry woven with symbolism, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Every element, every image, it's all layered with meaning. Like what? Give me an example. Well, take blood, for example. It's not just, you know, a vampire's drink. Right. It represents life force, vitality, even sexuality. Dracula's not just feeding, he's taking something more, right? Exactly. It's like he's draining the very essence of his victims. Oh, that's creepy. 
And what about those classic vampire repellents, the garlic, the crucifixes? They've got to be symbolic too, right? Oh, definitely. You could see them as symbols of faith, both religious and scientific. It's not just about the objects themselves. It's about what they represent. So it's about belief, the power of belief to fight back against something evil. Yeah, the idea that even in the darkest times, there's this force for good that can prevail. So like reason battling superstition, science versus the supernatural. Exactly. The hunters are using everything they can to defeat Dracula. And Dracula himself, he embodies so many of those Victorian anxieties, doesn't he? He's the ultimate outsider, a threat to their order and their values. He represents everything they feared. Change, sexuality, the unknown. The breakdown of society. And Nina, I think she represents that struggle too, that pull between tradition and change. She's intelligent, independent, but also vulnerable to Dracula's influence. Yeah, she's stuck between two worlds. Trying to find her own way while facing this incredible darkness. And that psychic connection she has with Dracula, that invasion of her mind, it's terrifying. It's like a metaphor for the loss of control, the fear of being consumed by something evil. So after all this, why do you think Dracula still resonates with us today? Why are we still so fascinated by this story? I think it's because it taps into these primal fears we all have, that fear of the unknown, the darkness within ourselves. And it also reflects those anxieties about a changing world, a world that can feel increasingly chaotic and uncertain. Yeah, it's like this mirror reflecting back our own deepest fears. And it reminds us that the battle against evil, it's not just something that happens in stories, it's something we all face. So Dracula is more than just a horror story, it's a warning. It's a call to be vigilant, to be aware of the darkness, both inside us and out in the world. Wow, that's some heavy stuff. But it's also a story about courage, about love, about fighting for what you believe in. Yeah, the good stuff too. Exactly. It's a story about the human spirit's ability to endure, to overcome even the darkest of challenges. Well, there you have it, folks. We've explored the depths of Bram Stoker's Dracula, the thrills, the chills, the symbolism, all of it. And I hope this deep dive has inspired you to take another look at this incredible novel, maybe discover something new within its pages. Or maybe just sleep with the lights on for a while, who knows? Yeah. Until next time, happy reading.